So the last topic that we have to discuss with respect to uh, phase diagrams involves the Clapeyron equation. Uh, what the Clapeyron equation does is says, hey, let's analyze this phase diagram. And there's some very important regions on here where you have a coexistence of multiple species. So we went over this before, but just a quick little review. We know that this line is where you can have solid and gas in equilibrium with each other, sublimation vapor pressure line. This green line here, we label the vapor pressure line or the boiling point line. This is where we have a coexistence between a liquid and a gas. And this red line is where we had coexistence, it's our melting point line, so it's where we had coexistence between a solid and a liquid. So these regions are really important. These lines, all right, are things to focus on, and that's what the Clapeyron equation does. What we notice from an analysis here is that this phase diagram gives us how P and T relate to each other. And what we'll notice is we're gonna to try to come up with a function to describe how pressure and temperature change for each one of these regions, what we'll see is that there's a different slope for each one of these regions. So each coexistence line has a different slope. So because each has a different slope, then we're going to have sort of three different mathematical analyses that we can enact. Um, with the idea that we know that there's coexistence there, <clears throat> and we also know what that means from the standpoint of chemical potential. So our whole mathematical approach here is, can I look at this region? Can I figure out how P and T relate through the slope, all right? Realizing that in this region right here on that line, the chemical potentials for each one of the uh, species involved is equal to each other, because you have equilibrium there. So what we're going to do is we're going to derive the Clapeyron equation. Then we're going to talk about how we can use it to pick out details of the curve and to build uh, other important sort of mathematical objects for us to use in our analysis of systems at equilibrium. All right. So on a curve, we have equilibrium between two species. And so we know from our last video, that, that means that those two species have the same chemical potential. So here, one and two, we're just going to refer to the two different states. Uh, this could be solid, this could be liquid, uh, it doesn't really matter, solid, gas, etc. Okay, but on a curve, this is true. So then we can go and we can analyze this from the standpoint of, I know what chemical potential is, it's molar Gibbs energy. So we have, all right, mu, which is a function of P and T on that curve, all right? Remember that curve, our phase diagrams are all about how pressure and temperature relate and how you can see states change based off of the pressure and temperature relationships, right? So we know we can write a d mu as partial mu, partial p at a constant t, dp, plus partial mu, partial t at a constant p, dt, right? Just like we've been doing all semester. We also knew that know that nu, all right, is molar Gibbs energy. So from last chapter, partial G, partial P at a constant T is volume, and partial G, partial T at a constant P is minus S. Well, how can we use these relationships up here uh, in our expression for mu? Remember how you go from mu to G? right? Molar G is mu. So if I look here, if I make this side molar, I can make this side molar. Think about dividing each side by n. If I make this side molar, I can make this side molar. Think about dividing both sides by m. So whenever I see a molar G, that's the same as a mu. So really, this object right here is the same as d mu dp at a constant t. And this object right here is the same as d mu dt at a constant p. So we can use our natural variable relationships from last chapter, and we can substitute them into this expression for d mu. So d mu looks like, substituting in those expressions that we just wrote down, d mu is going to look like a v 
dp, v molar dp, minus an s molar dt. So come out here, all right? We know that on those regions, on those curves where we have equilibrium, that the chemical potential must be the same, all right? If the chemical potential is the same, then changes in those chemical potentials must be the same as well. So let's apply a D to both sides so we can rewrite this. You keep writing down in your notes. I'm gonna write this as a D mu one and a D mu two. All right, we can apply a change to both sides. Then on each side, I can substitute in this expression, all right? Now we do have to keep track of subscripts here, okay? This is for a general d mu here. And here we have to make sure we indicate, okay, whether we're talking about state one or state two. So if I do that substitution into my equation, saying that the, because the chemical potential is the same, the changes in chemical potential are the same on the curve, we're gonna have a molar V1 dp minus a molar S1 dt is equal to a molar V2 dp minus a molar S1, sorry, S2, a molar S1, oh gosh, <laughs> let me say this again, a molar V2 dp minus a molar S2 dt. Now on that curve, and remember it's all about trying to find that slope, on that curve, remember, they're gonna be experiencing the same P's and T's on each side of this equation because you're changing mu and mu, mu1 and mu2 in the same way. It's just that the changes have these different proportionality constants associated with them because is the molar volume for a liquid necessarily the same as the molar vol volume for a solid? No, and obviously the same about the entropy. We could say the same about the entropy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna to try to solve this equation for dp dt. So to do so, I'm gonna take and I'm gonna bring this term to this side. I'm gonna take this term and bring it to this side. <coughs> so if we look at this little rearrangement, I have V1 minus a V2 multiplying a DP, and this is gonna be equal to a S1 minus an S2 multiplying a dt. So all we did there is we rearranged, we kept track of sign and everything necessary uh, to make sure that we uh, get the expression to maintain its equality. All right. Now I'm going to solve for dp dt. So I'm going to divide both sides by dt. All right. I'm also going to divide both sides by this expression. So I'm going to have s1 minus s2 on this side and v1 minus v2 on this side. So if I look at this, this now has essentially the form that we want. It's an equation for the slope. So it looks like on that curve what the slope is. And that slope depends on changes in entropy between the two states and changes in molar volume between the two states. So we can simplify this down. We know we're talking about a transition on that curve between one state to the next. So on that curve, we can write this as dp dt is equal to, well, an S1 minus S2 is a delta S, and I'm going to put T, R, and S down there. Again, reminding ourselves with that subscript now that we're talking about a transition between two states. And on the bottom, right, we can do the same idea. We can write this as a molar volume, right, change in molar volume with T, R, and S down there. Uh, indicating that we have, again, a change in state, so a transition that's occurring, a phase transition that's occurring. There's one last manipulation that we do to get to the Clapeyron equation, which we can then analyze from multiple standpoints, okay? <coughs> and we know from previous chapters that for a transition, delta S is equal to delta H over T. So then we can substitute this in for delta S at the top. And what we're left with is the final form of the Clapeyron equation. dp dt looks like delta H for your transition divided by the temperature of the transition and delta V for your transition. 
So all we did to get here was use the idea that chemical potentials on those coexistence curves are the same. And now we see we've derived a relationship, right? In terms of how P changes as T changes, right? We're gonna be able to build equations from this P and T equation, how they actually relate. And we see that there's a direct relationship between this slope to delta H over T trans and delta V trans, okay? So this is the Clapeyron equation. So this is how you would kind of get to a starting point for now, figuring out what those lines actually look like on a curve from a functional standpoint, okay? So let's use this and let's analyze a couple different situations that we run into, right? Where this becomes useful. And that word Clapeyron should kind of sound familiar from um, general chemistry and, and we'll get there eventually. Let's first take a look at the solid to liquid coexistence region. Let's look at that melting point curve, all right? <clears throat> so if I look at this, we can start to talk about this curve in more detail. So remember on the phase diagram that this curve is essentially really close to being vertical. It's not perfectly vertical, right? If I look at the triple point and I go up, that's the region we're talking about. We're talking about that curve that goes nearly vertical. So I wanna know based off of some properties of different systems that are important to us as chemists, is it truly vertical? Right? Is it truly vertical? And if it's not vertical, how is it slanted, right? For some situations, we're gonna find there's a slight slant this way. And for other situations, we're gonna find that there's a slight slant this way. And the Clapeyron equation is gonna tell us that. Now again, for a good approximation, you can assume that it's pretty much vertical, but again, what if we need those fine details, right? So how are we gonna do that? So let's analyze this first by making some assumptions, okay? So let's talk about a situation where we have that the density of the solid is greater than the density of the liquid, all right? So this is how you imagine most species behave. As you condense things down, you're packing more mass into a, uh, the same volume so that the density of the solid is greater than the density of the liquid. Well, where is that here? Well, from the beginning of the semester, remember that density is inversely related to molar volume. So when I make this assumption, when I say like, hey, let's look at a system where this is true, then that means that the molar volume of the solid, all right, is less than the molar volume of the liquid. All right, remember there's an inverse relationship between these. Okay, so now I can come down here and let's say I'm talking about going from a solid to a liquid. So what is this delta V down here? So what this implies, right, is my delta V for this transition, right? So I'm ending up in a liquid. The liquid volume is bigger than the volume where I started at, right? So my delta V for that transition going from a solid to a liquid is going to be positive. Well, hold on a second. We also know that going from a solid to a liquid, we can know the sign of delta H as well. So going from a solid to a liquid, the system must gain energy to break down those interactions, to put motion in there. It must gain energy in the form of heat. So we also know that going from a solid to a liquid we have a situation where delta H is positive. Well, let's look down here then. Delta H is positive, delta V is positive. T, these are always in absolute temperatures. They're always in Kelvin. So we know that that's positive as well. So we put all this together. And for this situation, we know that dP dt is a positive value. So it's nearly vertical, but it's definitely positive. So if I come back up here, all right, I see, okay, which one of these slopes is positive? Oh, it's this one. So this right here is the situation that we're talking about here, where rho solid is greater than rho liquid. So those fine details on a phase diagram, when you look at your melting point curve, again, it's nearly vertical, I'm just exaggerating it here, but when the density of the solid is greater than the density of liquid, you actually get it to go slightly to the right with a positive slope, all right? And that should all sort of make sense in the context of the Clapeyron equation within this analysis, okay? So let's look at the alternate scenario. What about something like water? 
Now, water is very special. And it has a lot of properties that we that really matter to us and affect us in everyday life. One of the important things and how like life survived through ice ages and stuff like that is that water has a situation where its density in its solid form is less than its density in its liquid form. Okay. That's why ice floats. That's why stuff could live at the bottom of lakes during an ice age because all the solid stuff went to the top. Okay. And it freezes from the top down and not bottom up, right? Which is important. So now how does molar volume change based off of this now? Well, we know there's an inverse relationship. So the molar volume of the solid is actually bigger than the molar volume of the liquid, right? We're still talking about a transition between a solid and a liquid. So we know we're gaining energy, but if this is the case now, where the molar volume of the solid is bigger than the molar volume of the liquid. Wait a second, our delta V down here, we're ending up in the liquid, right? So this is gonna be a small number minus a big number, right, in our delta V. So our delta V here is going to be negative because of the change in how the densities behave. So our delta H is positive, our delta V is negative, and what we're left with is a dP dt that's negative now. All right. And that's all because we have this situation where this is positive, this is always positive, absolute temperature, and now delta V for the transition is negative. So the whole thing on the right-hand side becomes negative. Okay. This then right, means that for water, what you'll see is different behavior of this line in the context of um, melting uh, solids to liquids. This line right now for water um, is sloped to the negative side. It has a negative slope. So again, it's nearly vertical, but it looks more negative in terms of what its slope is. And that's because rho solid is less than rho liquid, right? So I wanna to point to a um, figure in your book. Now I'm gonna draw just a part of that figure. And what you'll notice is if you look at this figure, which is figure 23-9, uh, what you'll see is it's the phase diagram of water. So I'm gonna just hastily and sloppily draw this out. All right, uh, the pressure here that they use is kilobar. I'm gonna focus in on the bottom part of this curve. And what you'll see is you'll see this sort of structure and I'm just looking over here to make sure I draw it correctly all right and that's all we really need here's liquid here's solid right and then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of put other solids here just to kind of make you realize that all of these different Roman numerals that they give all right are different types of ice right so you'll see different Roman numeral labels, right? You'll see, uh, I think a one here, a three here, a two here and a five here. Ice, right, actually takes different crystalline forms. And so those different crystalline forms are different technical states. So you can have solid, solid transitions between all these different types of ice over here. Now look at what's happening to actually make this occur. You're getting lots of pressure to actually force ice into some weird scenarios, okay? They're all happening at lower temperatures, right? The solid to liquid, we can see gas is somewhere down here. But while we're focusing on solid to liquid, uh, water has some really strange behavior when you get to high pressure scenarios, all right? The ice that we think about, right, is this guy down here. So let's take a look at this part of the curve. And what do we see, right? Between the solid ice, like the normal ice that we're used to seeing, and liquid water, we see that this curve right here, right, has that slope that we expect. So this is why the ice that we normally see under normal pressures, and I don't mean normal like one atmosphere, but under common pressures, right, the ice that we see, right, because of its density characteristics, right, is going to float, and then that indicates on the phase diagram that we actually have this negative slope that we see in a P and T curve, right? Now that means that whatever this ice is, is up here, and I think they label this I7, right? 
think about this as a question that I might ask, ask on a quiz or homework or something like that. But what about I-7 to liquid water, right? What can we say about I-7 and whether it will float or not in water, right? The only other things I want to point out real quick while we're talking about it is notice that there are some triple points here, right? So triple points can exist, not necessarily just between liquid, solid, and gas, but here's a triple point right here between three different solid states, right? Here's a triple point between two solid states and liquid, okay? <coughs> so the Clapeyron equation is important for us to be able to analyze the solid to liquid transition. And now what we're going to do is we're going to switch gears and actually try to build the function. So we used the function to analyze our form of our fa uh, phase diagrams, our forms that we see inside the phase diagram. And now we want to get to actually applying mathematical principles and coming up with equations we can use to make predictions in terms of the behavior of these species on those coexistence curves, like mathematical predictions.